Hello, and thanks for being here. Today we're going to be talking about developing grit and gifted students. My name is Todd Stanley, and I'm the gifted coordinator for Pickerington Local Schools. I've been in gifted education for over 25 years. And what you see here is my website. I sometimes go by The Gifted Guy. And so I have a website called thegiftedguy.com where you will find educational blogs, video tutorials on different strategies that can be used in the classroom, resources such as projects and other teacher materials, as well as tools for professional development. So we're gonna start with an activity. What I'm gonna ask you to do is the following challenge. So you see before you, there are eight sheets of paper and only one is completely visual, visible. And that's the one that has the one on it. And then this lays on top of the other pieces of paper. So what this challenge is asking you is to determine what is the piece of paper directly underneath the one? And then what is the piece of paper underneath that? And so on and so forth. And so you get to the number eight, which is the piece of paper that's covered by all the other pieces of paper. And so what you're gonna do is you're going to number these, these blocks, two, three, all the way till eight, depending upon where they are in the layer of underneath the one. So in other words, the two is the one directly underneath it, the three is underneath the two, the four is underneath the three, and so on and so forth. And so you get to the eight. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to work on that. All right, so go ahead and stop working on this challenge. So the logical question that we typically would ask in a classroom is who is successful? So here's the answer. So you can see the two and all the way till you get to the eight. So if you labeled it like this, you are correct. And this typically is what we ask in the classroom. What I'm asking though is this, if you were not successful, did you work the entire two minutes? Did you keep trying when you failed or felt like you were failing did you continue to to work or to try when you became frustrated did you push past this when you felt like you didn't know what you were doing did you just give up or did you continue on and so these are all elements of grit and grit can mean very different things to very different people so here are some synonyms commonly associated with grit. Resilience, character, positivity, mental toughness, and probably the number one that we, we associate is effort. So how much effort is a student willing to give? 
And we have those students in our class, classes that give a lot of effort, and we have those ones that do not give much effort. And we often attribute this to laziness. But really what this is, is the student's lack of grit in a lot of cases. And so I, I want to better def define what grit is. And so Angela Duckworth, who is a uh, professor of psychology, uh, did, did a study on grit. And she wrote an excellent book called Grit. Uh, and she's going to talk about what her research shows here in this TED Talk. When I was 27 years old, I left a very demanding job in management consulting for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests. I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily. So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still gonna be here in teaching by the end of the school year? And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is gonna keep their jobs? And who's gonna earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires, and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out, that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure. Things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school, especially for kids at risk for dropping out. To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. 
Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm going to end my remarks, because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful, and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. And so the logical question is, what does this have to do with gifted students? Because surely all gifted students give their best effort and their hardest effort. I'll pause while you laugh. If you've worked with gifted students in any capacity, we know this not to be true. Uh, and, and matter of fact, she talks about in the video how sometimes grit can be inverse to intelligence. So the students that are less intelligent are harder workers or grittier workers than the ones that things that, that are, have high intelligence. And so why is this? And so there are several reasons of this. One of this is that oftentimes things have come really easy to gifted students. They may already know how to read chapter books when other kids are learning their alphabet. They may know how to add some add and subtract numbers when some other students are counting to 100. And as a result, school has been easy for them. And this is especially true in the early grades. Uh, because those students had things come really quickly to, uh, or they may have, uh, you know, a, a background where they were uh, exposed to some of these things. But eventually, and this happens to everyone, it will catch up with you and things will no longer be easy. Things will be hard and things will be challenging. And the question becomes, if things have always been easy, how do these students react when they're finally met with a challenge? And because they don't encounter this struggle as much as a typical student does, they don't develop the you know, coping mechanisms in order to work through the, these issues. So what ends up happening is a gifted student who thinks of voice come easy too, um, and they've always had the answer, all of a sudden doesn't have the answer. And so the question is, does that gifted student, you know, accept that challenge and try and work harder, or do they just shut down? and say, oh, I, that, that wasn't easy for me. I'm not going to do that. And this is where we need to be developing grit and gifted students, especially because gifted students, I think, struggle a lot with this because things have come so easy to them, because things have never been challenging for them up until a certain point. And so you want to make sure that you develop this grit early rather than later, because what you don't want is you don't want a student getting all the way into high school and have never been challenged, all of a sudden they're challenged and they have no coping mechanisms. And yet they have classmates who this entire time have been struggling or have been have find things difficult and they have developed these, these coping mechanisms. So this is why those students that have a lot of grit ne don't necessarily have the intelligence because they need the grit in order to compete where the gifted students are, you know, in the beginning did not, but once they do need that grit, then they don't have it. So we want to make sure we're very purposeful about developing this grit amongst gifted students. So what I'm going to share with you are 10 strategies for de developing grit in gifted students.
There are many more than this, but these are the 10 that I've chosen to focus on. One thing I wanna make sure that's clear is that you do have to be very purposeful about this. You can't just hope that grit happens. You have to put students in situations where they're going to have to use grit, or you have to make them aware that they're using grit, or you have to make them understand that they're going to have to use grit in this particular situation. And a lot of times it comes down to your classroom culture. In the culture of your classroom, do you accept you know, that students are going to fail at times and that's perfectly okay? Is it a safe space for them to fail? Because that's ultimately what grit comes down to is some students are afraid to fail, especially if you're a gifted student and you've not failed most of your life and all of a sudden you're having some difficulties. And because you're afraid to fail, you just become paralyzed and you don't do anything and you don't try. Um, and so we want to make sure that we create a culture in our classroom where it's perfectly okay to fail. In fact, we encourage students to go big, to try and to use that grit. And even if it doesn't pay off in success, you still tried and you still developed that grit. So strategy number one I'm going to talk about is help them student, get the students to understand that, it, that you don't always have to have the answers. And that's perfectly okay. And sometimes in the culture of our classroom, we can set students up for this because we have that student who always has the answer. And then, so when we have a question, we turn, no one else can get it. We turn to that student and we make them the focal center of attention and they're expected to have the answers. But it's really important for gifted students to realize that we don't all have the answers, that no one has all the answers. And so things that, uh, uh, here's a quote, judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. So unfortunately in schools, we, we judge students a lot by their answers when we really should be looking at the questions that they're asking and not whether their answers are correct, but whether their questions are pushing the thinking, whether the questions are challenging people to think. And so I think one way you can set your culture in your classroom is to judge students by their questions rather than the answers that they give. So what this looks like in the classroom is giving students what are called messes or wicked problems. So these are problems that don't have solutions. So if you told your students, I want you to try to solve world hunger, that can't be done. We've tried that for thousands and thousands of years. There is no solution to that, but there can still be efforts made to help with that and to make that better. Um, other things that you might want to do is, um, you know, they may not know what needs to be known. In other words, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And so there may be a problem, a really wicked problem, but they don't know what all the possibilities are. They may have to research those and they have to, in other words, the answer is not going to come to them like that. They're going to have to look it up. I, I love doing Model United Nations with my students for this very reason, because the way Model United Nations works is... Students represent a country, they find a wicked problem that's affecting their country, and they try to come up with a logical solution. And I'm always amazed at the creativity that my students show in coming up with some of these solutions. And they may not solve the problem, they may not prevent the problem, but they still are attacking this problem in a creative manner, and they're, they're showing effort. They're not just giving up. Imagine if we just gave up trying to, to solve world hunger and people would starve to death. But we're, we're constantly trying to solve that problem, even though we're not arriving at one solution. And so that's what that might look like in the classroom. The second strategy I want to talk about is we want to help students to look at challenge um, as not an obstacle preventing you from getting the correct answer. Challenge is a good thing. When we put students in challenge programs, and then when they get B's, their parents complain or they get an A minus, they're, they're all upset and crying. And so I tried to try to teach my students when, when they were in my classroom that this is a challenge program and not everyone is going to get A's. And that's perfectly OK. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, our school systems have built up that it's not OK to not get A's or parents have built that up in them. And so I want students to look at these challenges as just that, a challenge, something that they're willing to, to try. And if it, they it don't succeed, that's perfectly okay. 
and not to punish them with grades when they don't succeed. That's that's another thing that we have to change in our classroom is when a student attempts something like I, I was talking with the teacher and she was talking about when she grades her math problems, she does not grade whether it's a correct answer or not. She grades the mathematical thinking that the student used during the trying to solve the problem. So they may end up with the wrong solution, but they use the correct mathematical thinking. Isn't that more valuable than if a student gets the correct answer, but doesn't know the mathematical thinking that they use? This is why we always tell students to show their work so that we can see this mathematical thinking. And so we need to start evaluating students differently rather than just the correct answer. Because as we know in life, many times there is no correct answer. There are many possibilities, but there's no one correct answer. And sometimes you do everything right and things still go wrong. And so it's important for students to learn that. And so here's a, a quote for this one. We develop our character muscles by overcoming challenges and obstacles. And this is how students develop their grit. This, because if they, if they have challenges, if they have obstacles and they're able to, to say, okay, this is what I did to try to overcome this one. This is what I did to try to work through this one. The next time they are faced with a challenge, they can say, okay, I did this the last time and it worked. So why don't I try it again? And so that's this is where they start to develop their coping mechanisms for overcoming these challenges and obstacles. And it starts to develop grit. What this might look like in the classroom is, again, you give them challenges. It could be simple STEM challenges like you see here, where you're asking them to create the longest possible paper chain from a single sheet of construction paper. Or it could be using only 10 index cards, construct the tallest possible freestanding tower. Now keep in mind, when you're doing activities like this, the goal is not to have success. So the group that has the longest possible chain is not the one that's the most successful. The one that's the most successful is the one that maybe had some struggles and pushed through those. And so I love doing STEM challenging challenges with my students for this very reason. And I tell them, it's not about who has the tallest tower at the end of this. It's about whose tower fell down and they yet they went back and tried to rebuild it. Or whose tower, what didn't work out at first when they started to build it. And so they tore it all down and started from scratch. Who was willing to take that chance? Who was willing to persevere? Who was willing to push through? And so these, these STEM challenges can do that. And, um, and so that's why I like to use them in the classroom with my students. A third strategy is we, we need to teach students that it's okay to take risks. As a matter of fact, we should encourage them to take risks because this is where the, the most learning takes place. When you look at learning, if things come easy to you, there is no growth in your learning. It's only when students are taking a risk, when they're trying something they don't know, when they're tempting something that they, they, they had never done before, it's only then where the learning really takes place. So we want students to be willing to take risks. Now, of course, we don't want to make it a danger zone where students feel scared to take risks. What we need to encourage them to take risks and help them to develop this skill set. So the quote for this one is, if you want it, go for it. Take a risk. Don't always play it safe or you'll die wondering. And so we don't want students to have to wonder. We want them to say, okay, I have this idea. I'm going to give it a try. Let's see how it goes. Let's take a risk. And again, you may do everything right, and yet still things don't go the way that you hope them to. So they, you may be launching a product and you do everything that you're supposed to do. You take the risk, you do whatever, and it fails, even though you did everything that you were supposed to. You still took the risk. And so and it didn't work out, but then you learn from that. You learn from those mistakes. We always tell students to learn from their mistakes, but do we really allow them to learn from their mistakes? So I, I've had teachers that don't give students back their tests. They only give them back their grades. So students don't know what they missed. They don't know to how to fix their mistakes. They don't get feedback on how to fix their mistakes. So we have to be setting up our classroom where we allow students to see the mistakes they're making and learn from those mistakes. One thing I saw a teacher do, which I loved, which was um, they, they completed this, um, this activity, it was called My Favorite Mistake. 
And what they did was they looked look back on the math they had done through the course of the quarter or the semester or whatever, and they looked for their, their biggest mistakes that they made or the mistakes, more importantly, the mistakes they learned the most from. So what did they learn from making that mistake? So it's important to help students to see that it's okay to make mistakes. And in fact, you can learn quite a bit from them. And so this is one that I like to use in the class. This is called a single point rubric. And basically what I want students to do is it's, a lot of times the way classes work, when students do all the requirements, they do everything they're supposed to do, they get the A. In my classroom, I try to set it up where if you do everything you're supposed to, you get a B. But if you want an A, you've got to take a risk. You've got to show some initiative. You've got to go above and beyond. You've got to, to dazzle me. You've got to give, give it a, a, you know, challenge yourself to push further. And so you can see that the, the, when it comes to the showing initiative, it's blank because students will take risks and show initiative in different ways. So there's no one way to show this initiative. There's no one way to take these risks, but I want students to do this. And so I can just write in the empty box, this is the risk that they took. They showed initiative, they took it, they attempted something, they did this. And so I like these single point rubrics because what it allows the students that just wanna do the work, they can simply do the work. But those students that wanna push themselves, it gives them space to do so. The fourth strategy I wanna talk about is we need to help them understand that perfection is not attainable. So you may have that student that it's a perfectionist. And because they're perfectionists, they are unwilling to take risks. They're, un they're not going to be able to develop grit because they're not going to make mistakes. They're not going to be challenged because they're just going to avoid those challenges because they want things to be perfect. This is that student that is not even willing to start because they're afraid it won't be perfect. And so we have to teach our students that nothing, nothing is perfect ever. And that's, that's the way, that's the way things are. And that's perfectly okay. So when I'm teaching my students about public speaking, we look at one of the most famous and great speeches of all times, which is the Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream speech. And so we watch that speech and we take a look at that. But then what we do is we analyze that speech and we look for what are the mistakes that Martin Luther King Jr. made. And there are a few that he makes in there. Um, he doesn't make great eye, eye contact. He, he has audiences behind him so whether they can't see him. There's lots of things that he does that could have been done better. It's still a phenomenal speech. It makes me tear up every single time I hear it. And it still is an example of a great speech. But I want students to see that even when people are achieving their greatest accomplishments, they're making mistakes. But sports is an excellent example of this. So a baseball player is going to fail seven times out of 10. And they're still going to be a 300 average. And they're still going to get in the Hall of Fame with an average like that. So baseball is all about failing because you're going to fail more then you're going to succeed. And so we want to make sure that students understand this. Um, so, so with, this goes with any sport. You know, in basketball, you don't make every shot that you you attempt. You miss a lot, but you, those, those that you make, you, you can't score if you don't try for the shot. And so I think sports do a really good job of helping people. There's no one, even LeBron James, who is the greatest basketball player I've ever seen, was not, is not perfect. He, he is always willing to take risks. He's always willing to try. And that's what makes him great. Not because he's perfect. And so the quote I'm going to show here is, at its root, perfectionism isn't really about a deep love of being meticulous. It's about fear. The fear of making a mistake, the fear of disappointing others, the fear of failure, and quite frankly, the fear of success. So we want students to get out of this fear of making mistakes because that's where the perfectionism, they're not willing to, to do something that may not be, work out exactly like they want it to. So what this might look like in the classroom is what you see here, where you have this TED talk, but what I'm actually telling students, and I tell, I'll do this with students, I'll say, if you wanna get an A, you actually have to do B, C work. So I want them to not necessarily make mistakes on purpose, but I want them to understand that, that for this particular one, they, they, they should not be perfect because they're not gonna be perfect if they wanna get that excellent grade. And so 
what I'll say is I'll say, if you want to name in this particular project, I need you to be in this mid range. And, and I, I don't do this all the time, obviously, because I want students to take risks and I want them to, to seek excellence. But at the same time, I want them to understand that sometimes, you know, you don't have to do your best or you don't have to be perfect in order to succeed. Um, and so I want them to, to understand that. The fifth one is learn how to handle emotions. Failure can be very emotional. Uh, you know, not succeeding can be very stressful. And so what we want to do is we want to help students to, to learn their social emotional coping needs, uh, their emotional regulation. You know, a lot of gifted students are, are very asynchronous, which is that their intelligence is up here, but their maturity is down here and they don't match. So as much as possible, we tr have to try to help them balance that out to whereas their academic and their mature maturity are kind of on the same level so that they're able to cope with these things. So this is that student that can do brilliant equations, but then throws a fit when they don't get their way on something. And so we need to help students to learn how to handle their emotions. So self-regulation is a better indicator of success than intelligence or talent. And so this is the ability to regulate your emotions. And so what this might look like in the classroom is putting students into groups and having them collaborate because group work can be really frustrating because you're dealing with others that don't necessarily think like you think, that, that learn at the pace or rate that you learn. Uh, they may not do things the way that you want them done. And so you have to learn to compromise. And so this is really important to learn to compromise with other people, to deal with conflict management, to uh, you know, develop, help other people develop their skills rather than yourself as well. And so I love doing group work and collaboration in the classroom because it helps teach kids the self-regulation. Now, just like grit, you have to be very purposeful with this group work. You can't just throw them into groups and hope for the best. You have to give them skills and tasks and you need to give them coping mechanisms to work in these groups and be successful. But by doing this, by having to work with others and being frustrated by that process, this is going to help them to develop self-regulation. And if you have that student that can't work in groups, you know, they're eventually going to have to learn to work in groups because everyone at one point or another will work in groups. The sixth strategy I want to talk about is developing executive functioning skills. And executive functioning skills are things such as time management, uh, organization, and prioritization. And the question to ask is, how much control are you giving students over these? So how much time management are you allowing students? Are you prescribing all the time for them? Or are you giving them a chunk of time and asking them to manage their own time? Are you organizing their tasks? Or are you giving them a chance to figure out how to best organize their tasks? So a lot of this ha has to do with uh, giving students the space and the choice in order to develop these executive function skills. And so executive function uh, strategies help students to go beyond the content that is being taught. Uh, they're learning the process rather than the outcome. And again, this goes against what we typically traditionally think of school is that it's all about getting the correct answers, but it's not. And it's not how real life works. In real life, we're not looking for correct answers. We're looking for the best answer possible for us. It's not necessarily the correct answer. Um, and so it's a process that we go through. And so it's important that students understand that the content, while important, is not as important as learning the how. So the what is not as important as the how. How did you learn that? You know, not what did you learn? And how can you repeat that in the future? Some executive functioning skills. Um, I talked about a few of these already, but there's also self-control, which we talked about before is one of the strategies. There is flexibility. There's planning, there's task initiation, there's all sorts of uh, skills that can be taught. The, the, what I use in my classroom, I think that teaches all of these really well, is the idea of project-based learning. Project-based learning is you give students a task and you give them a time period and they have to deliver this task within this time period. And sometimes this, this task is really prescribed where you say exactly what you want them to give. And other times it's not. It's just, I want you to show mastery of what this particular skill or this particular content standard. 
And so by doing this, what it, it asks students to do is they have to manage their own time. They have to figure out how are they going to divide this three weeks up? If they're working in groups, which I often do, how are they going to divide up roles? Who is going to do what? Um, you know, how are we going to compromise? What decisions, collective decisions are we going to make together to work on our self-control? And so project-based learning is, is really good, in my opinion, because it allows students to, to have a lot of control on what they're doing and to have choice in what they're doing. And as a result, they're learning the process, um, not just the end result. So in project-based learning, the end result is not necessarily as important as what they learn on the pathway to getting there and whether they learn good or bad. The seventh strategy I want to talk about is to realize that procrastination is not a game. I'm going to start this one with a story. And this is a story of my eldest daughter. My eldest daughter was a junior in high school. She was taking uh, English language arts and her papers were always due at midnight on Sunday. And so Friday would roll around and I know she'd have a paper due and I'm like, how's that paper coming along? And she would say, well, I haven't quite started on it yet. Um, and so I'd like, okay, she has time. So then Saturday would roll around and I'd say, how's that paper coming? And she's like, well, I haven't put words to paper yet, but I have been giving it a lot of thought. I'm like, okay, great. Well, she, at least she's thinking about it. Sunday afternoon would roll around. I'd say, how's that paper? And she's like, well, I'm almost to the point where I'm ready to start writing down my words. I'm just, I just have to capture a few more things. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And then about 1115 Sunday night, she would get up from what she was doing and she would walk, go into the office and I would hear her furiously tapping on her, the, the keyboard of our laptop. And it was about five to 10 minutes before midnight. She would, I would, she would, I'd hear the stop, stop of the typing and she'd turn off the light and she'd go upstairs to bed and she would get it in right under the wire. And every single time she got an A. And so what she was learning is that procrastination is a game. You can procrastinate to the last minute in this class and still get good grades. And so it became a game. She then next time she would start at 1120 or she would, you know, uh, you know, wait to, you know, even further to try to, to challenge the game a little bit more. And why this is dangerous is because when she got to college, what she found out is that you cannot procrastinate on a lot of the work that you're doing. You cannot wait to the last minute and expect to do well. And, and so as a result, uh, she had to learn this. And luckily she did learn it in college. But if she had not, she, she had not, if she had developed this procrastination game and she was not willing to adapt when she found out it wasn't going to work anymore, this could have been a real problem. But what I noticed is that when she had projects due and I would call her at college and I would say, how's that project coming? Even though I knew she had a couple of days left and she would say, well, I'm done with it. And I would be shocked. But she had learned that you shouldn't procrastinate. And so how do we in the classroom help with this? Well, one thing we can do is, so this quote is, action will destroy your procrastination. So taking that first step, showing initiative, being willing to take the first step is going to get rid of that procrastination. And as teachers, we need to do a better job of not giving students assignments where they can procrastinate. So if we give kids, you know, 30 minutes to work on something, and they can goof off for 25 minutes and get it and then do it really quickly the last five minutes and get it done. We're teaching them procrastination. So we need to give them activities that do not allow for procrastination. So this is, again, why I like project based learning. Project based learning, the way it was set up with the open endedness that I had was that students could not wait to the last second to get it done. And I had many students that tried when we would start project based learning. I'd give them a couple weeks for a project and they would wait to the last day or two and find they couldn't get it done. And so they were learning, I can't procrastinate. I can't wait to the last minute. And, and then by putting them in groups also, they couldn't procrastinate because the group was relying on them. And so they couldn't wait to the last minute because they were, they were the group was depending upon them to get certain work done. So I really like project-based learning because it allowed procrastination not to happen. And so there are various things that you can do to help with procrastination and getting things done on time. Um, when it comes to like individual students, getting rid of distractions around them and having a, a, a stress-free work environment. So when COVID hit and my youngest daughter was at home, she would sit in front of the fireplace 
with her laptop. She would have her iPad showing a video. She would have music on her phone when she was listening to with her ear pods. And she was not producing really good work because she had all these distractions. And so embarrassingly enough, I had, she never had a desk up until this point. So I went out and bought her a desk and put it in her room and asked that she do her work at her desk. Um, and so she started to do that and she, the work started to improve because now she had a, um, an environment where she was able to do the work without being distracted too much. Um, you know, tell others about your goals. So if you have a goal, tell them and then it makes it real or write it down. You know, that's why we have planners because you write it down and it becomes very real. Um, and so uh, having these deadlines can be really important and setting deadlines for yourself. So this is due in three weeks. So I need to get this done by this time. I need to get this done by this time. I need to get this done by this time. And so you set these many deadlines that help you bleed up to the final task that you have to accomplish. The eighth strategy I want to talk about is uh, don't stop just because you're done. And this is something, again, that traditional school teaches students really well. When you get the grade that you want, stop. Or if you finish the task I've laid out for you, stop. But are we giving students the opportunity to push past that, to uh, make sure that they are not just stopping because they're done? And so you don't stop learning uh, because there's always room for improvement. And I tell my students this, and I try to create this culture in my project-based learning classroom where I'll say, you're never done with the project. You merely run out of time. And this can, this can be in other things as well. So like in English language arts, when people finish an essay or a paper, couldn't they go back and make it better? Are there additional details they can add, more examples? Are there other things that they can do to improve? Could they, could they shore up the conclusion a little bit? Could they edit? There's always things to be done if you set the, the, the activity up correctly. There should be always room for improvement. So one of the things I try to teach in my classroom is this engineering design process. The engineering design process is what the, the process all engineers go through when they're trying to solve a problem. But this is not only for science. It can be used in math. It can be used in English language arts. It can be used in social studies. And what, what it's, it's uh, the process is that the students ask a question or a problem is given to them. Then they imagine the possibilities. What are the possible solutions? And then they plan, how can they get to those possible solutions? Then they create something that shows this. And most importantly is this one. They improve it. They have room to improve. It's part of the cycle. So you don't stop once you've created and you're finished. You figure out a way to make it better. And so getting this mindset in students' head that things can always be improved, not for perfection. We're not seeking perfection again. What we're looking for is just to make it better. And there's always ways to make things better. And so taking the opportunity when you finish something to then go back and, and seek to improve that. Not, and not just finish it because you're done with it but because you want to make it better. The ninth strategy is that students need to get used to change because um, change is inevitable. However, whether they grow from this change is totally up to them. So if you stand firm and you, you fight the change, then you're not going to learn. But if you learn to adapt, if you learn to be flexible, then you're going to grow as a result. And you're gonna realize that when things don't go exactly as they're, they, you plan them to be, it's okay. You have a plan B, you have a plan C, you have a coping mechanism to deal with something when it doesn't go the way that you want it to. And so I use this in my classroom. This is what I call a moving rubric. And I, so let's say I give students an activity that takes a, you know, a few days to do. So what I'll do is I'll walk around the room and observe and I'll, I'll make notes on where students are. Are they progressing? Are they meeting? Are they exceeding? And many times students from the progressing because they're just starting. And then I'll go back the next day and I'll, I'll observe and see if that if they're if they're getting into the meeting a, a part or if they're staying if they're staying stagnant and they're still in the progressing and then I may have a conversation with them if they they're not moving and so eventually I want all students to get to that exceeding part and I'll and I'll and I'll say I'll put an x and I'll put the date and I'll show them look this is how you progress this is how you changed this is how you adapted over the course of this particular activity um, and so it helps students to see how the learning process works and how they actually change during this learning process. 
The 10th strategy I'm going to talk about, and this is a really difficult one, is to stop focusing on grades. This is really difficult for a few reasons. First off, schools have valedictorians and class ranking. Colleges look at GPA um, and and how what you know. And your parents expect you to get all A's. I mean, how many of you, when you when your kid brings the report card home, do you immediately go to the lowest grade and you ask why? That's what we do. That's what we're kind of been trained to do. And so, what we need to do is do is train students to not do this, to not focus so much on the grades. Um, and so when you look at colleges, colleges are not looking at GPA as much as they used to. Schools are getting rid of class ranking because they realize it's it's creating an unha- unhealthy competition between students and not competing with themselves is what they should be competing with. And so good students aim for good grades, but great students aim for understanding. The problem with grades is it's a very extrinsic motivator. And so Students try to get this grade, and once they get there, they stop. Um, If you have an intrinsic motivation, so you're learning for the sake of learning, you're learning learning for the sake of understanding, then you're going to be able to push past, and you're going to be able to go beyond what just the the grade is. So there are several things listed on here as alternatives to letter grades, but the one I really want to talk about is number um, two, which is feedback. Feedback is really important. John Hattie, when he did his meta-analysis of thousands and thousands of studies, found that feedback, effective feedback, was one of the most, one of the best things a student could get to grow or to, to learn. And so what this looks like is, I want you to think about how much feedback you give your students. So, for example, if you give your students a multiple choice test and they get something wrong, you typically just mark it wrong. But do you give feedback as to why it's wrong or what they could have done differently or how could they could think about this differently? Sometimes my daughter will get, um, she'll get a grade, but she won't get the test back. They're like, well, they don't hand the test back. And so the student doesn't even know what they missed. How can they learn from their mistakes if they're not understanding what they missed? They need that feedback. So I think it's really important to sit down and talk with students and give them feedback. Uh, I, I've been teaching the last three years to students over in China. We do not have grades. I provide lots and lots of feedback, however, because they, studies have shown that feedback not attached to grades are, is much more effective with students. When it's attached to a grade, they're just worried about getting the grade. When they're getting the feedback and the feedback alone, they're understanding this is what I can do to improve. And so we want to make sure that we provide feedback. With my, our talent development program we started last year, we did not give grades. We just provided feedback for students. And guess what? Students still worked. Students were willing to put forth the work. And, and they were doing intrinsically, not extrinsically. They weren't going for this carrot or this shiny gold star. They were going because it was going to help them to learn. So I just want to remind you, so Angela Duckworth said in her video that grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we need to set our classrooms up to to be the same. So our classrooms need to be a place where students aren't just going from activity to activity to activity. They need to see the whole purpose of learning, the, the why of the learning. That's really important. So there are three things you might want to remember about grit. One is that you develop this with small wins. So what I mean by this is that it's something that you build. It's not something that you instantly possess. Okay, boom, I've got grit now. Or I went to the I went to the store and I bought some grit. You could buy grits. You can't buy grit. So it's something that you have to build up. So students need to realize that everything didn't go according to plan, but you learned something from this last one. How can you apply it to your next one? And so you're building and building and building upon that until you develop this grit. And you'll be developing grit your entire life. It doesn't end. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're, we're developing that grit. And so, the second thing is we want to have deliberate practice. So what I'm, I've kind of talked about this is what habits are you helping to, for students to set up in their classroom? So if they're working in groups and something doesn't go according to plan or something doesn't work, do they learn from that? And then the next time you put them in groups, are they able to practice what they learn from that? Um, and so we want to we want to have our classrooms be a place where students can have space in order to use grit and have choice to use grit. And this is how they they develop this. 
Lastly, have a sense of purpose when it comes to grit. Don't just like put students out there and hope grit happens. Uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that students um, understand, okay, you're developing grit. I want to make you aware this is how you're developing grit. This is even though this seemed hard and you had to go to plan B, this is what you, you got out of it. And so that's where that feedback comes into play is that you want to let students know that they did this and as a result, they got this. And so they're seeing the big picture of what they, they learned there and the grit that they got. So you can go to Angela Duckworth's site. The, the website is right listed right there, and you can determine your own grit. There is a questionnaire, and you answer questions, and it gives you a grit scale from one to five, five being that you're really gritty, one being that you're not very gritty at all. And so I use this for students as kind of a baseline. So when we start the year, I'll give them this grit scale, and they'll see where they're at, and then we see how they progress over the course of the year and how they grow. Because, uh, again, it's that growth mindset. It's important to see that they are growing.